Best of r slash malicious compliance episode 2. Due to the amazing response in my last one, I've decided to do another medical malicious compliance post. This one takes place in a dentist's office. I hope I'm not posting too often. First thing to know, I'm completely immune to lidocaine. Yes, this is a thing. Didn't discover this until I was an adult and it suddenly made sense why I hated dentists so much. Ever since, I've made sure to put this on every dentist intake form, usually under allergies. Closest to form usually has. Second, I chipped one of my front teeth when I was a teen. Every once in a while, I have to go in and get it resealed due to wear and tear. I was in college and the tooth needed to be resealed. I decided to try the dentist next to the campus as they had a good deal with our insurance. Standard. I'm a poor college student. Decisions. I get into my appointment, and an assistant starts prepping me for the procedure. In the chair. Pop on the bib. Etc. She then takes the tiny needle and pokes me in the gums to freeze me up. Exposed nerves in a broken tooth are painful. As I'm sure you've already guessed, she used Novocaine. Not that I knew. At first, she'll be assistant, for dental assistant, and I'm me. After waiting a few minutes for the shot to work, she starts poking around. I immediately feel sharp pain as she does, and start tensing up. Assistant, hold still. I know it feels weird. Me, with fingers in my mouth, it hurts. Assistant, no, that's just pressure. It's okay. Me, no, it hurts. She takes her fingers and scrape while implement out of my mouth. Assistant, annoyed, I already numbed you. It can't hurt. Me, it does, though. Really, she sighs and tells me to look up. While I do, she pokes me in the gums, and I jump. Assistant, shrugging. Looks like I have to give you another shot. Now, at this point, there's been zero numbing effect. I can feel everything. Me, are you using Novocaine? Assistant, actually, it's called Lidocaine. Novocaine is a trade name. But yes, me, I put on my intake form not to use Novocaine. I'm immune to it. Assistant, you're not immune to Lidocaine. No one is. I'll just give you another shot. Me, I am and it won't work. Please use something else. Any other numbing agent works just fine. It's only Novocaine that doesn't work on me. Assistant, you don't know what you're talking about. Let me do my job. I sigh and get ready to argue when I remember something. I pay a flat rate, and I have nowhere to be. Cue malicious compliance. Me. Okay. So, she gives me another shot. We wait a few minutes. She makes me look at the ceiling and pokes me after a few seconds. I couldn't see her do it, but I could definitely feel it. She gives me another shot and repeats. Doesn't work. Gives me another, and another. She gave me four shots of Novocaine, and I felt every painful poke and prod. Four needles in a row, even the small ones they use. Not fun, but I was committed. After the fifth shot, my mouth finally started to go numb. Me. Hey, that worked. I guess it just takes a lot. There's a pause. Assistant. I switched to a different agent for that shot. She sounded completely defeated. The dentist was finally called in, and he was pissed. Not only had I wasted at least an hour of their time and pushed back a bunch of appointments, all those extra shots meant they were now taking a loss from my procedure. My payment was far less than they'd had to spend on all that Novocaine. The dentist made her leave the room. Did my reseal in about 15 minutes, and barely spoke a word. After we were done, I double checked the amount I was paying, it was fine, and requested a second copy of the cost breakdown and receipts just in case. The receptionist was clearly puzzled at the length of my appointment and why the dentist and assistant were so grouchy, but I don't think she'd been filled in. Best part? About a month later, they sent me a second bill for all those extra shots. I called them and pointed out their fee policy, was told my bill was a mistake and to ignore it. They then continued to send me a bill for those shots once a month until I moved over a year later. It never showed up on my credit history, and I definitely never went back. Edit. As a few people have pointed out, Novocaine is not the same as Lidocaine. I was specifically told I have an insensitivity to Lidocaine, as well as higher tolerance to most anesthetics. I woke up in the middle of my arm surgery from my previous post. Not fun.
Please keep in mind that this is in Canada, not the US. Regulations differ between regions, including who can and cannot administer medication in an official capacity. I know this is low-grade MC compared to a lot of posts, but at the very least I cost this office money in the end for not listening to me and complying with the assistance request to let me do my job. If nothing else, it's interesting how many of you in the comments have had similar experiences. I've learned the hard way it's important to be your own advocate in these situations. Even if you end up being wrong about it, having your team double check is a good thing. We're all human, after all. Edit 2. Forgot the new rules. Replace the name acronyms with a position title. Sorry about that. Thank you. Next. Spouse is a lawyer that deals with large corporate deals. Her firm is renowned in the industry for being expensive, but also one that will make sure your corporate deals are more airtight than an astronaut's oxygen tube. A few years back, they are helping a client broker a 100M plus deal with two other major partners. The managing partner of her firm, who is one of the most incredible lawyers I've ever met, takes a look at the deal and notices at one point that there is a doomsday scenario that may occur in which the client can get royally screwed. He rings up the client, explains to them that if scenario X happens they'd be fucked and it's best if they build in some sort of contractual protection into the deal to mitigate the potential damage. Client refuses to do so because legal costs are already high and they don't think scenario X will ever happen. The managing partner explains to them that he's been at this for over 30 years and as their lawyer he highly suggests they at least consider putting a clause or two into the agreement just in case. Note that a deal of this size involved dozens of different documents and hundreds of hours anyways. The cost of drafting in the protection would have been less than 10k in extra legal cost. Client is adamant they don't need it and asks them to just finalize the deal and send the documents over to sign. My spouse emails them the documents with a message explicitly stating that they didn't include protection for Scenario X. Flash forward about 4 years. Scenario X happens. Lawsuits are flying left right and center and the client comes back to the firm in a huge panic. What follows is 4 months straight of backroom negotiations, angry phone calls, bruise millionaire egos and late nights where the managing partner and my spouse somehow managed to have their client walk away with 10m plus more than they should have. They did however lose something like 30m plus of their initial investment. At the end of it all, my spouse asked the managing partner why he never told the client even once. I told you so. He smiled and said, that'd be mean, especially after I send them their $263,000 legal bill for fixing this mess. Thank you. Next. Story from my mother, as I was preoccupied with figuring out why sand cakes don't taste good at the time. So, it's the very early 90s, the Soviet Union is no more, and people from its former member states flock out into the world, trying to find a better life for themselves. Well, Myla had taken a wrong turn somewhere and ended up in the shithole village in West Germany I grew up in, where she became friends with my mother. Myla had a son, a couple of years older than me, Robert. Robert was to attend elementary school in our village, but the ancient director refused to accept him. He doesn't speak proper German. Well, neither do any other elementary schoolers. They will move on soon anyway. Eh, I know best. Myla was devastated told my mother that her Robert is a smart kid, and that she wanted him to attend school, as he had been looking forward to it. My mother tried to talk sense to the director. No dice. If you want to waste your time, go to governing body and ask them to have him accepted. Ooh okay, she did just that. This led to a meeting between her, Myla, with Robert, the director and summoned from the governing body, to see if there was any real reason to hold Robert back. Part of the director's pitch was, I have been teaching math to first graders for the last 10 years, I know who is ready. Oh, did you now? The government agent said, suddenly very attentive. You do realize that there is a rule in place that the teachers have to rotate through the years, right? Well, long story short, Robert did attend the school, the director was on close observation until his eventual retirement and of course, Robert graduated with the highest degree you can leave the German school system with, making Myla very proud. Edited, thanks to you slash DJI Chaos for clarifying the difference of grammar school versus elementary school for me. Thank you. Next. TLDR. 
Lawyer tried to hardball my client. I proved his client committed a statutory offense and got what I wanted plus damages and dobbed his client in. So I work as a specialist property valuer. A few years ago a real estate agent friend approached me on behalf of his client. His client was a bookseller who operated a specialist bookshop on the 7th floor of a city building. A one man band small business. Nice bloke. Unfortunately nice bloke had decided to renew his lease for 5 years and signed the new lease without getting advice. His new building owner enacted the market rent review clause and jacked up his rent by something like 50%. Tells nice bloke, your new rent for the next 5 years is X. Nice bloke is distraught, he can't afford it. So he asks nicely to rescind the lease and he will move elsewhere. Estate agent friend has found a cheaper space for him, denied by building owner. Building owner says he will also sue if he breaks the lease. So the agents asks me to review the case. I look through the case. Nice bloke is stuffed. The lease is locked tight and they are justified in jacking up the rent. I think our only hope is to appeal to the mercy of the building owner's lawyer. So I call him and ask for a lease, penalty free, for my client. Mr. Lawyer says, stiff cheddar, you need to comply with the law. Try reading the lease. A real arrogant a-hole. Cue malicious compliance. Okay, I will. I read through the lease and note that all references to the Retail Leases Act have been crossed out. Fair enough. The act only applies to retail tenancies if they are below the third floor of a building. Nice bloke is on level 7. Act should not apply. But hold up am I gonna check that. I call the small business commission who administer the act, and they advise that, if you retail a good, like books, it doesn't matter what floor you are on the act applies. You could be on the friggin roof if you want. The level 3 provision only applies if you retail a service. This means the building owner has breached the act and failed to comply with the law. There's certain things they have to provide before signing a lease and timing they have to follow. A breach is no small thing. I get a ruling from the commission. I call for mediation with Mr. Lawyer. Present are Mr. Lawyer, building owner and their agent and nice bloke and me. I again plead for a penalty free release. No dice and they threaten to sue. I gently slide the ruling across the table to Mr. Lawyer. Me. Okay. Well as per your suggestion I read the lease. We have a ruling that proves the act applies to the lease. Your clients failed to comply with the act and committed a statutory offense. Lawyer. Reads ruling. I'm okay. We will grant you a penalty free release. Me. Oh. We don't need that. We enact our right under the act to terminate the lease. Penalty free and to seek damages for the landlord's breach of their statutory obligations and I'll be reporting the breach to the commission. Lawyer. No need for all that, let's just tear up the lease. Me. Sorry, that won't be complying with the law would it? Update 1. I just spoke with the agent on our side, we are still good mates. He can't remember the outcome off the top of his head but he thinks he might have leverage a waiver of nice blokes make good obligations, requirement to replace carpets. Paint walls and remove fit out etc. And he did move nice bloke to a cheaper space. He thinks he might still have a file on it so he will ring me back when he gets into the office. Update 2. So I spoke to the agent today and he doesn't have the file enumper but his recollection is that he negotiated a waiver on the make good obligations. Got 60 or 90 days rent free and relocation as a deal for nice bloke. We can remember if anything happened from the Dobbin. Thank you. Next. First. A disclaimer, this is my former co-worker's story and not mine. However, for easy reading, I will tell it in first person. We work in airline crew scheduling, where our jobs essentially involve ensuring each flight is fully crewed. This requires us to strictly adhere to many rules, including aviation regulations set by the Federal Aviation Administration and Collective Bargaining Agreements, CBAs, upheld by the pilot and flight attendant unions. However, some of the rules in the CBA can be a little flexible, especially when we can offer pilots additional compensation and they agree to waive certain contractual provisions in exchange. There is a CBA rule for this airline that outlines when and for how long a pilot can be on reserve, a window of time in which they are essentially on call, in case we need them to work, and states that if we have an assignment for them, it must start within that window or it's not contractual legal. However, 
we would frequently offer pilots additional compensation, usually a full day's worth of pay, if they agreed to waive that provision and work trips that start outside of their reserve window. 99% of the time, pilots would accept this additional compensation. Very rarely, in extreme circumstances, we could offer even more pay, sometimes up to 200%, and only if the flight would otherwise be cancelled and cause expensive operational disruptions. I should point out that, while most pilots are fantastic to work with, a certain percentage of them are very arrogant and entitled. It's an attitude that frequently occurs in the pilot population. I don't know why. I've worked in the industry for many years and the same personality tends to appear quite often, more so at the regional airline level, less so in major or legacy airlines. Anyone else who has worked with pilots before can attest to this. The arrogant attitude is especially pronounced towards crew schedulers though because we get to be the bad guys and make them go to work. This story concerns a pilot with this attitude slash personality who was on reserve. We had a four-day trip starting in Detroit, DTW, that we needed to find a captain for, but we did not have any DTW-based reserve captains that were legal to work it. The trip started around noon the next day, and it was currently late evening the day prior, about 18 hours before the trip started. There was a captain on reserve at that moment and for the next four days, but he was scheduled for evenings and the trip started outside his reserve window. So, I called him and customarily offered him a full day's extra pay to immediately go to bed and come back the following morning for this trip. He flat out refuses my offer, and then proceeds to tell me I should offer him 200% for the entire trip instead, so basically 4 days of extra pay. I explain that it is against our procedures to offer that much extra pay just to show up early, and even so we would have to offer that level of compensation to other pilots in seniority order first. He adamantly, and rudely, proclaims that there is no way he is going to work an illegal assignment, unless he gets 200%. I say okay and hang up. At that point, I came up with a brilliant plan. I look up our airline's flight schedule and find out there is a late flight leaving soon to go to Tampa, TPA, and a flight the following morning that operates from TPA back to DTW. So, I rebuild the open trip with all the same flights as before. Except now it is a 5 day trip that begins with these two flights as deadheads. A deadhead is basically a flight that the pilot does not operate. They usually ride with the passengers or in the cockpit jump seat. So he would fly as a passenger to Tampa, stay in a hotel, then fly as a passenger back to DTW just in time to work the flights I had previously asked him to work. The new trip was completely legal per the CBA, and it now started comfortably within this captain's reserve window. So, I assign it to him and call him back. He, of course, is not happy about it. He asks me to change it back and agrees that he will now take the extra day of pay, but I decline. The trip is legal now, and I don't need to change it or offer any extra pay for him to work it. I then ice the cake a bit. I humbly and calmly offer to let him deviate off the scheduled deadheads. Which normally means a pilot will not take the deadheads and will instead find their own transportation to the city from which their first operating flight departs, which, in this case, is his home city. I did the math later, and I found that even if he did not deviate, the cost of a non-revenue seat on both flights and paying for a hotel and TPA amounted to less than a full day's pay at his pay rate. There was no additional pay for the longer trip either since he was getting paid for each of the five reserve days anyway. My MC actually saved the company a little money. TL. Doctor I offer to pay a pilot extra to waive a contract rule and work a trip. He says he won't waive any rules unless he gets an absurd amount of money, more than I'm allowed to give. I make a few changes and the same amount of work no longer requires him to waive any rules, and he was no longer eligible for any extra pay. Thank you. Next. Long ago, and far away. My aunt lived in a township with private night watchmen who used whistles to signal each other and make their presence known. They came around to the house every six months or so to ask for voluntary payment, kind of like a tip but their entire income, my aunt said. But I never hear your whistles. From then on, the night watchmen made sure to always blow their whistles right when they rode past her window, I, E, every 15 minutes or so, all night every night. Thank you, next. My father has been a lawyer here in BC, Canada for more than 30 years. 
When he was starting out in his 30s he was hustling hard to support a stay-at-home wife and me, his young son, as he was very much a type. A. Personality with not much patience he sped on the highways, often, and he got speeding tickets, often. However, he took every single one to court and had every single one overturned. The reason was quite simple. At the time Canada was in the process of switching over from Imperial MPH to Metric KPH and all of the road signs had to be replaced. Now the BC legal code specified that a road sign was legally comprised of two signs on a pole. See below for a better explanation of the way the signs looked. Apparently at some point someone in charge of replacing all the signs with the new metric ones decided that they could save a considerable amount of money by printing all the information on one sign. But this no longer complied with the specifics of the legal code. So he would go back to the exact sign that he was ticketed because of and take a picture of it, and then bring the picture to court along with a copy of the laws in question. His defense was very simple. He would allow the arresting officer to take the stand and give his testimony regarding the issue of the ticket, and then show the officer the picture he took and ask them to identify whether that was the sign that he had sped past. They always agreed saying that it was in fact the very same sign. He thanked them and then dismissed them with no further questions. He would then bring the picture to the judge along with the bookmarked page of the BC Highway Act and present the judge with the exact wording of the law. Followed by his factual argument that since there was only a single sign posted, it did not constitute a legal road sign, as defined in the Highway Act. As I said before, every single ticket was dismissed and all my dad lost was a half an hour of his time. This worked for almost a decade, with him overturning literally thousands of dollars of speeding tickets until the law was changed. He still speeds BTW, TL, Dr. Bureaucrat cuts costs on road signs but they no longer fit the legal definition so my dad sped like a fucking madman for years with zero consequences. Edit. An explanation from a friendly redditor as my telling of this story was from a recollection of several years ago. I'm old enough to remember when Ontario put the new signs up. At that time, they were a white sign with black lettering that said, Maximum. Up top. The speed in. Obviously. Giant font below that. And then. On a separate piece of metal below that, same width as the above sign but one slash for the height, with black background and white text. KM slash H. Maybe that's where the two signs part comes from. Over the years, the two signs were merged to become one piece of metal, and appeared to be two because the sign shop drew outlines around both parts of it as it had been when it was two. Semicolon from U slash J 911.